Hello, everyone, and welcome back. In the previous lecture, we proved the Balzano Y Strass theorem. And if you think about what we did with the proof, we used a familiar method, something we've now used twice. And it was this method of interval halving. And we saw that as the intervals sort of collapse down on themselves, there's only a single point that's left in there. And that point typically is our limit that we are interested in. We similarly saw interval having when we saw when we proved the existence of a least upper bound for a set that is bounded above. And so therefore the goal of this lecture is to generalize this idea by introducing what's called the nested intervals theorem. So it's the same type of principle. You have an interval and then a smaller one inside it and a smaller one inside it and so on and so forth. And you have these sort of Russian dolls all the way down and the width of these intervals is going to zero well, then you can say that there is a limit point in there, something that is common between every single interval, just like what we did with Balzino Weistrass, where we proved the existence of a convergent subsequence. Now, this result, the nested intervals theorem, might not sound like it's all that interesting just on the surface. So once we finish proving it, I'm going to show you some really cool uh, ways that we can put this theorem to use and get some fundamental understanding about the behavior of the rational numbers inside of the set of real numbers. Now we've already shown a few slides or a few lectures ago that there are numbers that are outside of the rationals. So our, our example that we used was the square root of two. Now we showed that it's not rational, but we didn't really show that it exists. And so that's what we're going to do as we move through this lecture. And like I said, let's begin with the nested intervals theorem, and then we'll talk about some of its consequences. Okay, so the theorem is stated as follows. So we have a theorem, and this is again called the nested intervals theorem. Now, of course, when theorems have names, even if they're not named after people, if they have a name, that means they're referred to a lot and therefore they are important. So this is uh, this should set off some, some bells in your head that this is itself a very important theorem in analysis. So let's say, suppose we have an interval A1 comma B1. So, and then that contains another interval A2 comma B2 which contains another interval called A3 comma B3, and so on and so forth, all the way down to A sub K, B sub K. And this chain goes on and on and on forever. So again, think of those interval halvings that we were doing with uh, the balzano weierstrass theorem. And we're gonna assume that this thing is a decreasing. So each, uh, eventually, you know, these things are getting smaller, these intervals. That's what the subset notation is telling us. And this is called a nest. So I'll just put that in red to highlight this new terminology here of closed finite intervals. So not all of these intervals are closed and finite, that means they have finite length, that means A1 and B1 and A2 and B2, A3, B3, et cetera, these things are actual real numbers. None of them is infinity or minus infinity. Then suppose that, so suppose also, sorry, that the width of these, or the length of these uh, intervals is going to zero, as k goes to infinity. So again, just like what we saw with the interval having, we saw that the, the length of each interval was half of the length of the previous interval, and eventually these things are going to zero. Well, the nested interval theorem says, then there exists exactly, so I wanna really underline this for you, exactly one point, we'll call it L for limit, that resides in the intersection of every single one of these intervals. So there's only one point that's in every interval in common. And moreover, AK converges to that point and 
BK converges to that point as L or as K goes to infinity. Now, again, put this in the context of what we did with interval halving. This is exactly what we did, especially for the least upper bound proof, where we show that the endpoints, their Cauchy sequences, they converge. We then show that they converge to the same point. Well, this is just generalizing that. Now we don't have to take interval halving. We just not have to know that we're shrinking the intervals. And essentially, these intervals are collapsing into a single, single, single point. Okay. Let's take a look at the proof here. It's actually very, very similar to what we've been doing before. So it actually doesn't take a whole lot of work to prove this. Of course, we're proving convergence. That means we're starting with an epsilon bigger than zero. Well, then we know that there exists a capital K such that, so some, some number that if we look beyond this capital K, uh, this implies that the length of each interval so let's say BK minus AK is less than epsilon. Now, where does this come from? This comes from the assumption that BK minus AK is going to zero, right? So the length or the width, however you want to think of this, of each interval is collapsing to zero. So eventually, you know, if you find a small number epsilon, uh, all of the intervals are going to have width less than epsilon. But also, but for all k bigger than or equal to k, we have that the endpoints of the next intervals, so beyond this, all belong to the, the capital K ones. I'm going to try and emphasize that's a capital K by sort of drawing it comically large here so that you know that I'm using capital K. But this says that the, the left endpoint, and you can do this with BK as well, the left endpoint of each successive interval is in the place where you started. In our case, A capital K, B capital K. So thus, if I take J and K greater than or equal to K, this implies that AJ minus AK is less than epsilon as well, because they all belong to an interval that has width less than epsilon. Now, this is, again, go back and take a look at our interval having procedures. It's the same thing that we're doing over and over and over again. And so hence, AK is a Cauchy sequence. And we love Cauchy sequences because from the completeness axiom, we know that this thing has a limit. And so there exists an L in uh, let's just say in R such that AK converges to L as K goes to infinity. But then since, uh, since K is greater than or equal to N or since when K is greater than or equal to N uh, implies uh, that for all N, so bear with me for a second. I'm going to write this out. It's a little bit harder to write than it is to actually conceptualize that A sub K belongs to each successive interval, right? This is the nesting property, right? So I'm trying to state this in the most general term possible. It says that if I look at an interval, then every endpoint for the successive intervals in the nest below it then my endpoints are in that thing, right? This is coming from the original nesting property in the first line of this statement of the theorem. And this happens, um, this tells us that it follows that the limit also belongs to these intervals for all n. So this is telling you that if your sequence belongs to you know, if, if all of these successive elements of your sequence belong to, to the interval uh, above it, so k greater than or equal to n, that means that your limit has to belong to every single one of these intervals. So again, this is something that we proved uh, in more detail with the least upper bound proof. So you might want to go back and revisit that. But this is an easy consequence. And this says, and so L belongs to the intersection of all of these intervals. Why? It belongs to every single interval. It's something that is in common between all of the intervals. 
And so now let's assume that there's another point that's in common. Remember, we said this, this is unique. So we say, imagine there's a second point, call it L prime, that belongs to this massive uh, intersection, right? This intersection of all possible intervals. We're going to show that this thing has to be capital L. So this tells us, so also, then the difference, actually, maybe I'll write this on the next line. Sorry, the distance from L to L prime, well, since they belong to each interval, this is less than or equal to the length of, the, of each interval, of course, because they belong to every single interval for every single K. But this goes to zero as K goes to infinity, which tells us that L is equal to L prime. That's the only way that this distance from L to L prime can be bounded above by the, the width of every single interval, right? This happens for every single one. And so the only way this can be satisfied is coming from the fact that this must be zero, right? So this is a sort of squeeze theorem that's happening here. So hence, uh, L is unique. That tells us that there is only one such point that is going to make this work. And let me finish up this, this, uh, this theorem with one more line on the next page, but let's take a look. What is it that we're missing? Well, we've shown that AK converges to L. We've shown that there's exactly one point. So that's the uniqueness argument inside this nest. The last thing is to show that BK also converges to L. But this is relatively simple, because we can say observe that the distance from BK to L, remember we want to show that this goes to zero because this would be a convergence argument. Well, this is the distance, this is at most the distance from BK to AK. And that comes from the fact that L belongs to, so let's put this, L belongs to the interval AK, BK. And so therefore the maximal possible distance that L can have from BK is just the maximal possible width of this interval. But again, this is going to zero as K goes to infinity, showing that the distance from BK to L is also shrinking. And so, sorry, that tells us that BK goes to L as K goes to infinity as well. And that is the proof. So it may not be uh, that exciting because most of what we've done before uh, or most of what we've already done sort of covers most of this, right? We've already kind of seen this with the balzano weierstrass theorem. We've already seen this with the existence of a least upper bound. In this case, we're just making it super, super general. So there are parts of this proof that I sort of uh, went a little loosey-goosey on, but that comes from the fact that we've already seen most of the details that come with this, especially in the case of the least upper bound. The important aspect here is that this nest collapses down onto a single point, L. And if we wanna know what that single point is, we just track the endpoints of each of the intervals to see where they're going. And this is the important part because this is what we're gonna use uh, for some examples here. So before I can get into those examples, I wanna start with the definition. Now, this is an extremely important concept in all, of, uh, uh, in all of mathematics, really, but in particular analysis. So we're going to say a subset S of the real numbers. So S stands for subset. It could be any collection of, of real numbers, infinite or not infinite or finite, I suppose. Well, this thing is called, so this is called dense. Okay, it's called dense in R, so in the real numbers, if and only if, uh, for all X in R, there exists a sequence SK 
of elements in S such that SK converges to X. Okay, so what does that say? You say that you have a dense set if you can always find a sequence of elements from that dense set that converge to any single element in R. It doesn't have to be in the dense set, right? It, importantly, it should be outside of it. But what you should think about is density gives you a method of approximating elements. And in particular, that's what you're gonna see with the rational numbers uh, in the next example. But what this really says, uh, this last point of convergence right here, it says, I can use elements of S to get as close as I want to X, even if I'm not allowed to access S, right? You can, or X. You can imagine maybe you've been restricted to the subset S. And so you want to get a good approximation of, of some real number without being able to just use that real number. Now, this should be starting to sound a little familiar to you because this is how computers work, right? Of course, we do not have access to pi. Pi is an irrational number. The square root of two is an irrational number. And so therefore, we don't actually have access to them on a computer. The only thing that we can do is we can approximate them by the rational numbers. So in this next example, we're going to prove that the rational numbers are dense. So we will show that Q is dense in R. Now, you may not think that this is really that exciting, right? You type 3.14 into your calculator and you use that to approximate pi. But this is an extremely, extremely, extremely important result. Why is it important? Well, because if, if the rational numbers were not dense in R, that would tell us that there are you know, real numbers that are sort of inaccessible to us because on a computer, we can only use rational numbers at best, right? Finite decimal expansions. So if, if the rational numbers were not dense, life would be extremely difficult because there would be numbers that just could not be accessed by a computer. So even though this doesn't look like it's that interesting of a result, and even though it's something that you're sort of taking for granted on a daily basis, well, it's still a very, very important thing that we need to carry through us, or carry it with us through mathematics because it underlines all of modern technology. Okay, so let's look at the proof of this fact. So what we're going to do is pick an arbitrary element of the real numbers and using the definition above, we are going to find a sequence that converges to that uh, real number. And that sequence is entirely contained or made up of rational numbers. Okay, well, the first thing is, if X itself was a rational number, we could simply set, so we could simply set S sub K equal to X uh, for all K. So you just have a constant sequence equal to X. Well, that's perfectly valid because that's a constant sequence of rational numbers. And so clearly S sub K converges to X as K goes to infinity. So that's really not that impressive, right? Of course you wanna do this for numbers that are outside of the rational numbers. That's where the real advent of this is. I don't need to approximate one over two, right? Because I can already put that into the computer, for example. What I wanna be able to do is approximate, say the square root of two or pi. So let's suppose, so, so suppose X does not equal to the rational numbers or sorry, it's not an element of the rational numbers, which implies X is irrational, right? So you probably know what irrational is. Technically, we haven't defined it in this class, but it means just an element of the real numbers that's not rational, right? So the square root of two, pi, E, right? These are sort of famous examples. Well, then there exists an element of the integers such that 
n is less than x, which is less than n plus one, right? So this is a number on the number line. I can put it between two integers. And of course, this is going to be strict because the integers themselves are rational. And so it can't be, a, uh, x is not a rational number. It can't be an integer. So it has to lay, lie between something. So for example, the square root of two is between one and two. Pi is between three and four. E is between two and three. So that's all we're doing. Then we'll say let a1 equal to n and b1 equal to n plus one. So you can see where this is sort of going. So these are both rational numbers. Of course, I wasn't going to just introduce the nested intervals theorem and then start talking about something completely different. We're clearly going to use the nested interval theorem. So then uh, the midpoint of A1 and B1 is again rational, right? So if you take two numbers that are rational, add them together, and then multiply them by another rational number, this is again rational. So in our case, A1 plus B1 times one half, A1 plus B1 over two, that's our midpoint. So this tells us, similar to the balzino weierstrass theorem, x must lie in one half interval here. Uh, but not the other, of course. So maybe the thing to do here is to draw a little picture. So let's put my my number line in red. So here I have, uh, let's say in green, n, and here's n plus one. And in blue, I've got my value x. And so then what I do is I take the midpoint of this, this interval, right, right here. So this is n plus n plus one, over two, which is just n plus a half. And so you can see that now x lies in the left half interval. So if I get rid of the n's for a second and I rewrite this, you can see exactly how this is going to go. I have a sub k, b sub k, and then I have a sub k plus b sub k over two. And the important point is, this is a rational number, this is a rational number, and this is a rational number. So I'm never going to encounter the case where the midpoints or the endpoints of this interval are actually equal to x. I'm just going to be chasing x back and forth through these, these slicings of the intervals uh, in order to identify which half it's in at each point. So let's write this properly. Let a2, b2 uh, be the half interval. Containing, containing x. And let me go to the next page. So then we're going to continue just like I did with my picture. Now we cut a2 and b2 in half. And select A3 and B3, uh, the half containing X. Okay, I'm just going to say repeat, right? So you can keep going along these methods. It actually takes more time to write it out than it does to just sort of conceptualize or even draw a picture of what's happening here. But here's the thing. We can note that the distance of BK minus AK, well, this is taking the original distance, B1 minus A1, and then just having it K minus one times. And remember the distance of the original interval is the distance from integer N to integer N plus one. So this is just one over two K minus one, which is clearly going to zero as K goes to infinity. Also, 
since we've been having intervals, we've got A1, B1, and that contains A2, B2, because that's just half of that interval, which contains A3, B3, and so on and so forth, right? So I've got a nest of intervals. And so by the nested interval theorem, well, actually one more point, and X is common among all of these intervals, right? So by definition, I'm chasing X down while I'm taking these halves. And so by definition, X belongs to every single one of these. So by the nested interval theorem, or nested intervals theorem, uh, AK converges to L, and BK converges to L as K goes to infinity for some unique L inside every one of these intervals. Okay, now here's the active point, right? L is inside every interval. And we know that there's only one point that belongs to every single one of them, but we already said that X is in every single interval. So, but clearly L is equal to X uh, since X is in every single interval for all K greater than or equal to one and only one real number can be in every interval, right? So that's what the nested interval theorem tells us. And since, and so moreover, AK and BK are in the rationals for all K greater than or equal to one. Remember they're either just, they're the endpoints, which were rationals, and then the next ones are made up of taking the midpoint of those rationals, which are themselves, again, rational numbers. So uh, not only did we find one sequence converging um, to, to our irrational number X, we actually found two, right? The AKs and the BKs. So this show is, so showing Q is dense in R. And there it is, right? There's the proof that the real numbers are dense in, or sorry, the rational numbers are dense in the real numbers. Now, one of the things that we like to say here is that since the, the real numbers are complete, right? So that's what the completeness axiom says, it says all Cauchy numbers, can, or sorry, all Cauchy sequences converge in the real numbers. Well, since the rational numbers are contained inside of the real numbers and they're dense, uh, we've, it, this tells us that any set of numbers that contains limits for all of its Cauchy sequences and that contains the rationals must also contain the real numbers. And so what this really means is, as I've said before, we call the rational numbers a sort of completion of the real numbers. So again, you think of the, the integers being formed from the natural numbers by including subtraction. So you, you have these negative numbers. You think of the rationals being formed from the integers by doing some division process. And now what you can see is that the rationals can be used to form the real numbers through this completion argument. So you say, you know, take all the Cauchy sequences and the rational numbers and give them something to converge to. Okay, now let's do one last example. Let's go back to our favorite irrational number. And that is the square root of, of two. So we will show root two exists in R. And we're gonna do this with the nested intervals theorem, right? So we've kind of already done it. We've said that it's, in, it's not a rational number and we sort of found these sequences that converge to it, these Cauchy sequences. What we're gonna do is we're gonna show how we can approximate this thing uh, using the nested intervals theorem. So, Proof. Recall from earlier, so, so from a previous lecture, uh, we constructed a sequence 
So remember what we did, we constructed the sequence XK as follows. So this was X1 was equal to one, X2 is equal to 1.4, X3 was equal to 1.41, X4 is equal to 1.414 and so on and so forth. And you might be thinking, you know, I'm just putting in the decimal expansion for the square root of two. So, you know, you put the square root of two into your calculator and you sort of pick the first few digits, but that's not actually uh, what we're doing, right? This has an actual um, process here. So I don't, I'm assuming I don't know what the square root of two is. So I say here, X sub K is the largest K digit number. So K digit decimal greater than one. And such that XK squared is less than two. Okay, so if I put any other numbers, like if I put 1.5 for X2, that would not satisfy x squared. Uh, x two squared is less than two. So that's actually how you're doing it. You're trying to find the biggest k-digit number so that when you square it, you're still smaller than two. Similarly, we could have constructed constructed uh, a decreasing sequence. So the decreasing sequence, we'll call it y sub k by letting y sub k be the smallest k digit decimal such that y sub k when you square it is bigger than two, right? So the x sub k's are coming up from below the y sub k's are coming down from above. And so thus you get uh, the distance from y k to x k. Well, they're going to match at every single digit except the last one. So this is one over 10 to the k minus one. So for example, y two would be 1.5. Y three would be 1.42 y4 would be 1.415, right? So they're only just the, the last digit is off by one. And so that tells us that the distance between these two things is just the measurement of that last digit being off, which goes to zero as k goes to infinity. And so this tells us, so we see that the intervals xk to yk, well, these things satisfy the hypotheses or conditions, however you want to think of it, of the nested intervals theorem. Thus, there exists a unique, so this is important, right? So from the nested intervals theorem, there exists a unique limit L, which belongs to every single one of these intervals, xk to yk. So what you remember what we're doing, we're coming from below the square root of two and above the square root of two, and we're converging down on these intervals. They're sort of, they're, these intervals are converging to zero. And we also know xk approaches L as k goes to infinity and yk approaches L as k goes to infinity. Now the question is, is L equal to the square root of two? Well, we know from algebraic combinations of sequences that if I square xk, then this thing converges to the limit squared, right? Because I'm taking the product of two convergence sequences. And we also know that since xk squared is less than two, we know that the limit itself has to be less than or equal to two. 
And yk squared is similarly converging to L squared so that L squared is greater than or equal to two. That's coming from the properties of the yk. It's approaching, so yk squared is approaching two from above. xk squared is approaching two from below. That tells you that the limit L squared is less than or equal to two, but it's also greater than or equal to two. So thus L squared is equal to two. And we found a number that squares to be two, which implies that L is equal to the square root of two, which exists in the real numbers. And the reason it exists in the real numbers is just because the nested intervals theorem tells us that this limit is itself a real number. So we, we use the nestable, nested interval theorem here to say that there exists a limit. And then we showed that when you square that limit, it actually gives you two, which means, you know, by definition of the square root, that limit must be the square root of two. Okay, so we got to see something pretty cool today, right? The, the nested interval theorem was just sort of formalizing or making concrete something that we already understood, probably. And that was this sort of interval halving method. Now, the nice thing about the nested interval theorem is it allows you to do things without just having the interval. But the real important piece of what we saw today is that the rational numbers are dense in the real numbers. As I mentioned while we were talking through that, that is a very, very important result for all of mathematics because it says that you can approximate numbers that would be, say, inaccessible on your calculator or computer or any type of technology that uses numbers. You can approximate it to any accuracy you want using rational numbers, which are very, very accessible, right? They are just finite decimal expansions. So I can do this. I can work with a rational number, even on pencil and paper, Whereas I can't write out pi because I just can't write an infinite decimal expansion. So this is the real power of the nested interval theorem. What it's doing is helping us to show that the rational numbers are dense in the real numbers.